Hey there. So I thought um, I'd like to start by finding out a little bit about you, although I can't exactly see you. Uh, I was wondering if you could just raise your hands and say how many of you might have felt at some point that your memory wasn't just quite as good as it needed to be. Okay. And how many of you might have had to make a decision under some amount of stress? Okay. And how many of you might have felt some degree of undue anxiety about an event? Okay, thank you. So many hands went up, I could see them, even in the dark. Well, the good news is that meditation studies have shown that meditation practice can be useful in every one of those situations. And I've taught meditation practice over the last 36 years now to thousands of people, everything from executives at Google to elementary school children, from active duty soldiers deployed in Iraq to priests and rabbis. I've taught meditation these days, of course, to many people who are looking for work. I've taught meditation to people from every kind of faith tradition and no faith tradition at all. And what I've discovered, which is really tremendous, is that even when people start with a great deal of skepticism, that the actual practice of meditation can yield quite interesting and powerful results, and people get an awful lot happier. This is a photo of the fire truck of a firefighter I know is a friend of mine who got so much out of meditating that he described squeezing in a meditation session while he had to sit at a manhole fire for about three hours. And I don't know if you can see, there's a copy of one of my books, Real Happiness, in, in the window of the truck, somehow mysteriously next to a roll of toilet paper. I don't know if there's an association or a link of any kind. I keep meaning to ask him, and he's never mentioned it. And my friend, the firefighter, is not alone in his enthusiasm. A 2007 survey showed that one in 11 Americans practiced meditation of some kind. And they reported that they were undertaking meditation practice to help with stress, with anxiety, with illness, sometimes a crisis. And people also say they turn to meditation because they just want to be calmer. They want to feel more connected to those around them. They want to notice more about their lives. They want to be happier. I know the word happiness can be kind of controversial. Even when I, I speak about it quite a lot, and you know, many of my book titles sort of have it snuck in there. And many times people will protest. They'll say something like, have you ever seen the bumper sticker that says, if you're not depressed, you're not paying attention? And I say, well, yeah, I, I can understand that point of view, but I don't think of happiness as something superficial or shallow or, or kind of happy-go-lucky. I think of happiness as a tremendous inner resource that gives us an ability to care about others as well as ourselves that gives us an ability to have energy in our work that really can be a powerful force for good in this world. So I'm gonna to talk today about this idea, share with you some of the research about meditation, and we'll do short meditation ourselves. But first, I wanna start with some ancient wisdom from a great sage. Each of us actually tells some kind of story about our lives, who we are, what gives our lives meaning, what we're capable of, what our lives are about. And think for a moment about the stories you tend to tell yourself. Are you a winner, a loser, a hero, a frightened person who will never change? These stories, of course, aren't always true, but they're often how we make sense of our world. They're born of what we say to ourselves, what we say to others, and what others say about us. One of my students one day was feeling incredibly stressed, and she went to the gym. And she described taking off her clothes and, in the process, 
ripping a hole in her pantyhose. So she said to the woman, a complete stranger standing there, I need a new life. And the woman said to her, no, you don't. You need a new pair of pantyhose. Our attention is nearly continually distracted by the thoughts and the feelings that make up these stories. We can be dragged around by them, exhausted and overwhelmed. And this lack of attention can actually be downright dangerous. Just think of all the distracted drivers you know out there. This habit of distraction can be lethal in our personal lives as well. We tune out, we don't really see the people we love, and others. Someone can be right in front of us, but our attention is so obscured, we don't notice their gifts, their vulnerability. The interaction is as though in a dream. And much of the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves are quite negative. We may be endlessly reliving our past mistakes or quite anxious about future ones we haven't even made yet. And this isn't our fault. The mind thinks thoughts that we don't plan. It's not like we say, well, at 3.15, I'd like to be filled with self-hatred, please. <laughs> we say when conditions come together for something to arise, it will arise. And when we miss the present moment, we miss the happiness that's always available to us. Meditation is actually a training in attention. We learn to stabilize our attention. We learn to open our attention, refine our attention, so that we can be more aware, not only of our inner landscape, but also of what's happening around us. It teaches us to notice our experience and our responses to those experiences without immediately judging what we see. And in that way, we can capture the energy that maybe previously was expended in blaming ourselves or blaming others around us. So that, that quality of blame gets transformed into compassion. And you can begin to meditate at any time. No preparation is needed. No allegiance to a belief system is needed. Now we're gonna do a warm up, okay? This is something I learned some years ago. I want each of you to touch space. Ah, you're good. Now, when I first heard this exercise, I kind of poked my finger in the air. I see some of you were doing that, most not. And the person who offered it to me laughed hysterically, and he said, you're already touching space. Space is touching you. So meditation is a little like that flip, to be more receptive, to notice what's actually going on anyway. So how did I get here? In my junior year in college, I went off to India with the hopes of learning how to actually meditate. I'd gone to school, State University of New York at Buffalo, and in my sophomore year, I took an Asian philosophy course, which is where I first heard about meditation. I'd come from a very painful and chaotic home life, and I had a, a really compelling need to understand that in a different way. When I got to India, I heard about a very respected teacher who was offering a meditation retreat for people who'd never done it before. So I thought, okay, I'll go. And actually, I was sort of disappointed when, when I got there and when I started, because the very first instruction I received was, sit comfortably and feel your breath. Just sit comfortably and feel your breath. And I thought, that's it? I came all the way to India. You know, where's the magical, esoteric, fantastic instruction that's gonna wipe out all my suffering and change my life immediately? Feel my breath. I could have stayed in Buffalo to feel my breath. <laughs> but I soon found out not only how difficult it was to do in a sustained way, but I found out how incredibly transforming it was to anchor my attention in the moment through the simple act of inhaling and exhaling. 
it was there in India that I found out how many people found their lives transformed through meditation practice. Came back in 1974 and in 1976 with some friends, I opened up the Insight Meditation Society in Barry, Massachusetts. IMS, as we call it, was the first major mindfulness center in the West, founded by Westerners and run by Westerners, and it's still going strong to this day. And I continue to be passionate about this work. More and more people around the world are coming to meditation practice, and just one small sign of that is that my books have been translated into many languages, including Korean, Chinese, Hebrew, Dutch, Vietnamese. And when they arrive, very sadly, I often don't actually know what language they're in. One of the reasons for this, of course, is that there is a tremendous amount of research now going on. When I first came back from India, if I was at a party or some social situation and somebody came up to me and said, what do you do? I'd say, I teach meditation. And the very common response would be, they would sort of like sidle away, like, ooh, that's weird. And now, honestly, even in some unusual situation, like maybe coming back into the country through customs or something, somebody will say to me, what do you do? And I'll say, I teach meditation. And the most common response I hear is, I'm so stressed out. I should, really, I should really do that. Although my favorite response, which I also hear, is my partner should really meet you. That would be really good. And I do think that this new field of research, which is having such compelling results, is in part responsible. When I was young, we were taught that the brain was pretty well fixed and unchangeable at a time well before adulthood. But in the last 20 years, this idea of neuroplasticity, that the brain can change in both structure and function, has really become very prominent. It's believed that the brain can change in response to environment, experience, and training, and meditation is one of those brain-changing activities. Recent studies have shown that meditation may be as important as exercise. And through new technology, scientists have been basically been able to watch the brain on meditation. And the results are significant. It turns out that meditation can help the brain in a lot of functions. And here are some of the many conditions where the use of meditation is being explored in studies all around the world. How does it work? This is some of what researchers are discovering. Neuroscientist Sarah Lazar from Harvard and Mass General Hospital did a study in 2005 which showed thicker tissue in the left prefrontal cortex of meditators an area of the brain important for memory, decision-making, and well-being. As we get older, this part of the brain normally shrinks. Now, Dr. Lazar study, studied very ordinary professionals in the Boston area who were meditating 40 minutes a day. She wasn't studying people who'd left it all behind and moved to a cave in the Himalayas for 40 years. And in her research, she suggests that meditation might actually help slow the aging process of the brain. What I found amazing in her study is that the 50-year-old meditators had roughly the same thickness of the prefrontal cortex as non-meditating 25-year-olds. And this study done last year shows that meditation also helps with another part of the brain that's associated with memory and learning the hippocampus, and you can see here the change for the meditators compared with the control group.
And here meditation was shown to decrease the size of a part of the brain, the amygdala, which is the more primal part of the brain that activates the, activates the fight or flight response. So the smaller the amygdala, the less stress we feel. More and more studies are confirming all of this, that through the training of the brain through meditation, we lower our stress, we help our focus and our memory, we improve our immune system, and simply put, it just plain makes us happier. Maybe this is why it works so well for athletes. Basketball coach Phil Jackson, who's a meditator himself, had, had his teams first the Chicago Bulls and then the LA Lakers use meditation to improve, to improve focus and teamwork. And guess what? Jackson has led more teams to championships than any other coach in NBA history. So maybe it's time we tried a little meditation exercise together. So I'm gonna guide you through it. If you just sit comfortably, as comfortably as you can, you can close your eyes or not however you feel most at ease. And I'm gonna offer you what I went all the way to India for. <laughs> Sit comfortably and feel your breath. See if you can rest your attention on the feeling of your breath wherever it's clearest for you. At the nostrils, at the chest, or at the abdomen. Just the normal, natural breath. Bring your attention there and rest. See if you can feel one breath. And if you find your attention wandering, slipping away, you can gently let go of whatever. Bring your attention back to the feeling of the breath. And I hope you can see in this very brief exercise that meditation can be a resource and a refuge, something that can offer us some greater calm and clarity. We can be more present and focused. And the best thing of all is that you can take it with you wherever you go. No one even needs to know you're doing it. It's like the perfect mobile device. So thank you.